Hi everybody, good morning. My name is Dr. Mary Claire Haver and I am a board certified obstetrician gynecologist. I am also the creator and founder of the Galveston Diet and a certified culinary medicine specialist. I have married my passion for women's health, menopause, perimenopause, all things menopause and nutrition into my program, The Galveston Diet. Um, you can learn more about it at the link in my bio at the top of the page. Um, or if you Google galvestondiet.com. Today, I've gotten a lot of questions about the menopods, the menopod, the menopause belly, the menopod, what is your favorite name for it? Um, you know, and I have some great tips here in this talk today on ways that are evidence-based, meaning there are actual studies proven that this works, on ways to reduce menopausal belly fat. Um, this is one of a uh, question that I get quite often, and um, all of this information is actually available in my blog at galvestondiet.com. So if you come in late or you um, can't stay for the whole talk, I do talk a lot and for a long time about these uh, subjects because I am so passionate about it. So if you're just joining me, I know you're all getting notified that I'm here. Today I'm going to be talking about uh, five tips to fight menopausal belly fat that actually work. So if you are not menopausal, if you are Pre-menopause, you are welcome to stay and learn because this is great nutritional advice that'll work for you as well. If you are not someone who will go through menopause, then um, you are also welcome to learn because these are very healthy nutritional tips that will work for everyone. Hi, Blake, I see you. Um, so if you don't mind, if you're just joining me, in order to make this algorithm work, double tap the screen so you just kind of click on my face like this couple of times, everybody, everyone double tap 10 times. That helps drive the algorithm so that we get as big of an audience as we can. And if you have any questions, I am more than happy to try to get to them at the end of the talk. You drop them that you can click on the interact button right there and you can put your questions there. Thank you for all the likes. It really does help to drive this algorithm and keep me relevant on this platform, which sometimes is hard for a 53 year old, uh, um, menopause warrior. I also do share these videos on TikTok and Facebook. So if you uh, come in late and can't catch the whole thing, we can't, um, you can't rewatch them on TikTok, but you can go and, and by the end of today, I'll probably have it uploaded. So thank you everyone for all of the shares, the likes. You can also share this video via the share button if you see, uh, if you think of anyone who you feel like this would be um, a helpful talk for. So um, I'll reintroduce myself one more time, then we'll jump right into it. So if you're just joining, because there's about 550 of you right now, I am Dr. Mary Claire Haver. Um, if you don't follow me, I welcome you to join our family here at Dr. Mary Claire. I am a board certified gynecologist. I'm a 53 year old mom who's been through menopause. I have a unique perspective of being a former residency program director um, at a major teaching institution. Um, and I've become a menopause warrior because once I went through it myself, I realized that there is a tremendous lack of knowledge, teaching, education, and even empathy for the menopausal woman. And we, and as a former educator, I realized that we are not teaching the next, the future generations of physicians how to take care of, uh, of us properly. So it has just been my passion my mission to spread as much normalization knowledge and information about menopause and menopause education. I'm also a certified culinary medicine specialist, which makes me a nutritionist. So I often talk about all things nutrition, and that's one of the topics we're going to cover today. So five tips to fight menopausal belly fat that actually work, <laughs> that actually work. So I know that for many of you, weight gain may seem unavoidable as you reach middle age. About 85% of us will have a sudden, unexplainable, unexplainable increase in weight gain that has nothing to do with calories in, calories out. I heard it for years in my clinical practice, and when you actually look back at the data, a woman can expect to gain three to five pounds per year um, during perimenopause and menopause. And no one seems to have a good explanation for that. Um, the experts, uh, the physiologists tell us, well, they're just not working out as much and they're eating more. Well, that's actually not the case. Even if a woman changes nothing about her exercise routine and nutrition, she can expect to gain weight. About 85% of us can expect to gain weight during this time and also have more than the weight gain is a change in body composition. We start gaining weight in places where we never did before. A sudden increase in abdominal fat or belly fat. So 
Let me start with, there is a difference, very, very big difference. And I think a lot of the personal trainers have not caught up with the latest research on this. When I talk about fat, visceral fat, abdominal fat, belly fat, I'm talking about medically, we call it visceral fat. I did not learn this in menopause, excuse me, in medical school. I learned this during my nutrition study. So this is kind of Modern obesity research, this is very, very new information, so stay tuned with me. So subcutaneous fat is the fat you know, the fat you're familiar with, the fat that is under the skin. It gives us curves, it gives us cellulite, and we can pinch an inch. That is the fat here that you can see, okay? We all need some of it. It is, it is healthy, it is how our body stores excess calories. I am not negating laws of thermodynamics. Calories in, calories out is a thing, okay? Very, very different than visceral fat. So visceral fat is the fat that is not under the skin. It is inside of our abdomen. It is the fat that wraps around our internal organs, around the liver, it, the omentum, which is a fatty layer that covers our bowel, normal, healthy. Uh, it, it's kind of a shield there. It protects our internal organs. It becomes very, very thick and hugely fatty. It, uh, fat that wraps around our um, large intestine, small intestine, stomach, uh, kidneys, adrenal glands, and fatty liver disease. All of this fat is a very different type of fat. This fat is metabolically active. So subcutaneous fat is cosmetically distressing for a lot of us. Okay. We don't like it. When I grew up, you did not want to have fat showing anywhere on your body. It's different now. Thank God kids have a more broad acceptance of different body types. Thank goodness. My children do at least and are embracing people's curves. Okay. Subcutaneous fat is not really that much of a sign of poor health. Subcutaneous fat is a sign of genetics and curves, okay? Subcutaneous fat is not metabolically active. Now, it can cause wear and tear on your joints and make it harder to move around. And, you know, putting on a weighted blanket every day, if you have excess fat, makes your life harder. No one's negating that. But this fat is not metabolically active. And it's very responsive to calories in, calories out. This real fat is driven mostly by insulin, cortisol, and androgens. It's hormonally driven. And it is a metabolic fact that a woman will have a sudden acceleration of visceral fat deposition in the two years leading up to her menopause when she stops her periods, okay? Any woman out there listening to me right now, is this ringing a bell? All of a sudden, you're in late perimenopause and you are seeing a change in your body composition that you cannot explain. Your abdomen is expanding. You are depositing fat. You are becoming an apple where you used to be a pear. Now, if you've suffered from insulin resistance your whole life, this does not apply to you. These are for women who really did not struggle, had a fairly flat abdomen, but then all of a sudden, they're gaining weight and they cannot explain it. They're exercising the same. They're they're eating the same and nothing is changing. And I'm going to go through, okay, so this is visceral fat. Visceral fat is metabolically active. It is highly inflammatory. It becomes a factory of cytokine production. Okay, cytokines are chemical modulators and mediators in our bloodstream that lead to inflammation. They are signals of inflammation is coming. Okay, they cause inflammation. This starts off the cascade of insulin, increasing insulin resistance, increasing leptin resistance. And so what can we do about it? What can we do about it? Okay. No one wants this visceral fat. It is so increasing abdominal circumference or the waist tip ratio. And I'm going to explain this in a second is a better sign of health, a better indicator of health of poor health or good health than your weight or your BMI. Let me say this again. Your waist hip ratio and or abdominal circumference is a much more accurate indicator of health than your weight or your BMI. Your weight and your BMI do not take into account muscle mass. I have patients that come into my clinic every single day who look normal. Their weight is normal, their weight is normal, and their BMI is normal. And they're just coming in for me to tell them how amazing they are. And I have the terrible job of telling them that their muscle is low and their visceral fat is high. They are not healthy. We need to do some work here and they're shocked beyond all belief. Visceral fat, again, much more powerful indicator um, than this, okay? Than your weight or your BMI. Okay, now on the flip side, I have a patient coming into clinic. She had high visceral fat, 
pretty good muscle to start with and a weight that she was not happy or comfortable with. We put, you know, worked on her nutrition, worked on exercise, you know, gave her a sound program, started her on hormone therapy in five months. Okay. But she was happy. She lost seven pounds. However, her visceral fat was down 30 points and her muscle mass was up three pounds. Her body fat percentage had dropped like five or 6%. Okay. She was outstandingly healthier than she was, even though the scale had not changed that much. I considered that a huge victory. And she walked out of my office happier than I'd ever seen anyone. Okay. So what are some of the things I talked to her about? What are some of the things that you can do about, okay. So I'm seeing the questions. Okay. How do you, how, what, how do you know if you have visceral fat or not? Well, the gold standard, the absolute best way to do it is with a CT scan or an MRI. No one's paying for that. That's not going to happen. Okay. The next thing is a DEXA scan. So a lot of us have DEXA scans to uh, all my patients to measure bone density. It's a standard way to measure bone density for, to check for osteopenia and osteoporosis. Correct. And it's also is a really nice way to say if you have visceral fat. So if you happen to be getting a DEXA for some reason, ask your doctor to go ahead and print out the visceral fat so you can see it. Some clinics have them in their offices and do it just for visceral fat. They're very, very hard to find. I invested in my clinic on an in-body scanner. Now, there's three levels, of, and it's, a, it's an impedance test. So it runs a, you stand on some metal pads, you hold on to these things with your hands, and it runs a current through your body. And then fat re, it measures the resistance. And so fat has different resistance than muscle, than water, than organs, etc. And so it is a very good way to have an idea of how much visceral fat that you have. So a lot of gyms have them. I have the medical grade one, the one that is used in like clinical testing at like Harvard and whatever, you know, I invested in this for my patients so I could give them as accurate as possible. So you can look up in body scan and see if there's a doctor in your area. I think they carry a list somewhere or just look and call and ask and see. But I do this routinely on my patients and because I want them to be as healthy as possible. We at Mary Claire Wellness and Galveston Diet, we are not here for your bikini body. I mean, that'd be great if you can get in a bikini. God bless you. And that's amazing. But we are here for your old lady body. Okay. We are here for you to have strong muscles, dense bones, a healthy brain, functionality when you get older, because I surveyed my followers. So drop this in the comments. I want to see what you guys think, because I know my audience on TikTok tends to run a little bit younger than it does on my other platforms. So tell me in the comments. What scares you the most about getting old? What number one, two thing, just put it in the comments. What scares you the most about aging? And for me, I thought it was going to be cancer. Literally, I thought everybody would say cancer because that's what scares me because I have two brothers who have died from cancer. Okay. And f my mother is one of seven kids. Five have died cancer. Okay. <laughs> On my dad's side, half of his siblings, cancer it scares me to death. Okay. People, okay, weight, not being mobile, Alzheimer's, losing strength and mobility, dementia, getting fat. Okay, keep going. I want to see it. Loss of cognitive function, cancer, losing my memory, cancer. So cancer, osteoporosis, Alzheimer's, heart attack. Okay, keep them coming. These are real things. So when I sit down and talk to a patient, when I am talking to my menopausal crowd, this is not the quick weight loss crowd. This is the kicking ass at 70 crowd. This is the functionality, mentality, being able to be functional and take care of yourself and feel good in your own skin as you get older. Because I love my mother, but I do not want to be her. I do not want her health problems. I do not want the, what she's suffering from right now. And so taking care of myself through nutrition is a priority. Taking care of myself with exercise is a priority. Supplementing the gaps in my own nutrition are a priority. And yes, I don't have any contraindications. I do use HRT. So back to menopause middle. Sorry for that tangent. Okay. All right. Here we go. What are some basic nutritional things? And when I say them, I want you to write them out in the comments so other people can see. All right. So, so why does this happen? As estrogen levels begin to fluctuate in perimenopause, remember average age of menopause is 51. Normal, meaning under the curve, is 45 to 55. It is absolutely normal for a 45-year-old woman to go through complete menopause and be done, okay? All this, like, you have to be 50, you're too young, that is not statistically correct. And then perimenopause begins 7 to 10 years before that, when the estrogen levels begin to fluctuate, okay? So, you can have hot flashes, night sweats, mood swings, as well as your abdomen increasing. This is happening almost across the board, all right? As estrogen levels drop, 
we experience a rise of active testosterone and other androgens. These and the fat distribution begins to shift from the hips and thighs to the abdomen. Who is experiencing this right now? Like all of a sudden you're getting a belly where you never had one before. This is new, okay? This is new. Hang on. I'm, I've got my notes over here to make sure I don't miss anything. So, yeah. So, remember, and this belly fat, this menopause, this menopause belly is dangerous. Okay? It's not perfect, but it's a fairly good indicator. Better than your weight or your BMI. Experience increased risk of heart disease, diabetes, dementia, breast cancer, and early sudden death. Okay? So, going through this change without getting this deposition of of your visceral fat increase is key to your long-term health, key to your long-term health, okay? So how do you measure the waist-tip ratio? You need a tape measure, okay? And you're gonna measure in two spots, two spots. All right, so I'm gonna try to do a demonstration. Let me move this over here. All right, so waist-tip ratio. You, it doesn't matter if you do it in centimeters or inches you are going to measure around the thinnest part of your waist. Okay, so here's my tape measure. Now, if you're bloated, you wanna do this first thing in the morning, okay? First thing in the morning, but here we go. We're gonna show you Mary Claire's abdomen. <laughs> this is funny, let me see if I can raise this up. Okay, so here's me. This is real me, 53 year old mom, just worked out. Kinda of bloated from uh, sushi last night, but I'm doing all right. All right, so tape measure. Thinnest part of your abdomen. Mine is a little high. I don't have a normal waist. My thinnest part of my abdomen, here's my belly button's down here, is up here. So I'm gonna take the thinnest part of my waist, okay? Now, if you are a complete box or you go out, just pick your belly button. That's fine, okay? Thinnest part of your waist, and then the widest part of your hips, where your butt sticks out the most. All right? Those two things. Thinnest part of your waist, widest part of your hips, okay? You're gonna divide those two. For a woman, less than 0.85 is a really good indicator of health, 0.85. Forget what it is for a man. I think it's like 0.9 for a man, but I'm a gynecologist and I don't treat men. So um, 0.85 for a woman is an indicator that more than likely you do not have excessive visceral fat. For a man, I think it's 0.9, but you probably wanna look that one up. Greater than one means more than likely you do have an excessive amount of visceral fat. So you do the smallest part of your waist, the widest part of your hips, and divide the waist by the hips. Okay, that's it. So, Top tips to decrease belly fat throughout menopause and all belong and, and all beyond. Okay, here we go. Number one, now there's gonna be a little bit of math here, a little bit of math here. Okay, so let me take a break. TikTok is uh, wanting me to um, take a break and reintroduce. Uh, and if you guys are watching on Facebook or on YouTube, just give me a second. I'm Dr. Mary Claire Haver. I am a board certified OBGYN. I'm also certified in culinary medicine. I've combined my passions of, of women's health care, menopause, and nutrition into the Galveston diet. You can learn more about our program. Click up here at Dr. Mary Claire. And if you're just joining, everyone double tap the screen to like this video. That helps drive the algorithm and keep me relevant on this platform. You can um, double tap by just popping, like I'm doing right here, you just pop my face, just hit my face 10 times on the screen. That really helps. Okay, so number one, that helps drive the algorithm and keeps me relevant on this platform. If you have any questions, drop them here in the interact button and then here to share. Okay. Number one, eat more protein. Women, ladies, we are not getting enough protein in our diets routinely. In the standard American diet, we are not getting enough protein. Everyone asks me, how much protein do we need? Well, this is built into the Galveston diet, but if you're not a part of a member of our program, no problem. I'm going to tell you anyway. All right. Studies have shown that people who eat at least one to 1.5 grams of protein for every kilogram of lean body mass have less belly fat than people who eat less. In the standard American diet or the Western diet, most women have almost no protein at breakfast. They have toast or cereal or oatmeal or something, okay, with zero protein. At lunch, they have a little bit of protein and then they try to stack their protein at dinner where they have a piece of fish or chicken or whatever. 
your body can only process 30 grams of protein in a sitting. So if you're stacking your protein needs at night, then your body is gonna convert whatever's over that 30 grams to fat. It is important for leptin and ghrelin, the hormones that control your hunger and your satiety, that you receive protein throughout the day. So one of the things we teach in the Galveston diet is that you probably need, if you're an average size woman, somewhere around 70 to 75 grams of protein a day, according to that formula. But again, we are all different, okay? So it's one to 1.5 grams for every kilogram of lean body mass. So lean body mass is basically your, for most of us, back of the envelope, your goal weight, okay? So it works out to somewhere around 70 to 75 grams. This is the same if you're a vegan or a vegetarian. You have got to make sure you're getting enough protein, okay? It is harder for you because you are choosing not to have meat in your diet, okay? So um, whole, uh, eggs, fish, legumes, nuts, meat, dairy products, all great sources of protein, okay? Not everyone can eat all of them or choosing not to eat all of them, that's fine, but you have got to make sure you are getting enough protein and dividing it up throughout the day. There are wonderful studies that are showing that people who do this on a regular basis have less visceral fat than people who don't, okay? All right, uh, number two. So number one was get enough protein, get enough protein, get enough protein. Number two, Make sure you are getting enough fiber. This is a core tenant of the Galveston diet. Fiber, fiber, fiber. Americans are not getting half of the fiber that they need. You know, very few, um, very few Americans are getting enough protein. Uh, excuse me, are getting a protein or fiber. So there, there's several reasons why getting enough fiber, especially soluble fiber, will decrease belly fat. Studies show that people who consume more soluble fiber, remember, soluble fiber is the prebiotic. It is the food for our gut microbiome. So the more you feed, the greater variety of the bacteria in your gut and the healthier your outcomes will be. And a new study showed that people who have a very gut microbiome, they actually went in and did cultures and counted how many different species were in the gut, um, have a lower chance of belly fat. This is the whole brain gut connection, the gut health connection. You cannot ignore it. It is not, this is real science. This is absolutely a thing. So where can you get the fiber? Dried beans, oats, honey, oat bran, rice, barley, citrus fruits, apples, strawberries, peas, potatoes, and the list goes on and on and on and on. Okay. All of this information is on our website. All of this is in our blogs. I have food lists for fiber. I actually sell a really good fiber supplement if you're interested. But again, I'm not here to sell products. I'm here to teach. Um, the, remember, we only supplement when there's a gap. So for me, I know because I track. And my favorite tracker is Chronometer. It is a... Chronometer is a nutrition database. It is not an app for keto. It is not an app for calories. I mean, you can track all that on there. This was a database that my daughter turned me on to because this is the one they use in her registered dietitian school, okay? And I wanted one that was as accurate as possible, that had the best nutritional information. I have partnered with them. It is free. It gives you a ton of information for free. And it is in my link at Dr. Mary Claire. If you go to the link in bio at the top of my TikTok page, you can check it out and see. Track your nutrition, guys. You've got to track to see if you're getting enough nutrients. How do you know? Do not rely on the food companies to tell you that you're getting enough nutrition. That is not their job. Their job is to sell more stuff, okay? So... For me and my diet, because I track religiously, I know I'm getting about 25 grams of fiber a day, but I, because I am type A, I push to 35. I want to get at least 35 grams per day because of my history of cancer, okay? And it makes me feel better. So I supplement those last 10 with the Galveston Diet Fiber. Again, you can go check it out. So, um... Number three, so we talked about protein, we talked about fiber, and now we're going to talk about probiotics. Probiotics. So probiotics are healthy bacteria naturally found in food and some supplements that support gut health. Studies have shown that probiotic supplementation actually can reduce belly fat, okay? Um, in another study, women who took the probiotic supplement lost 50% more weight than women who took a placebo. So there was a randomized controlled study in women in perimenopause and menopause. Half of them got placebo. The other half got 
um, probiotics and the group that was on the probiotics, and they were put on a nutrition program, and the only difference was these people had probiotics and these people didn't, the probiotic group lost more weight and lost more belly fat. The end. Now, if you are drinking kombucha every day or getting miso or fermented things or yogurt, you may not need to supplement with probiotics probiotics. Um, so on the days, I don't eat a lot of the fermented foods. They're just not, my palate is not my, it's not my friend. I have yogurt probably three times a week. Um, and um, so foods rich in probiotics include yogurt, sauerkraut, miso soup, soft cheeses, kefir, sourdough bread, though some people think the probiotics die, um, acidophilus milks, and soft sour pickles. Okay. Only thing on that list I eat routinely is yogurt. Um, so, um, all right, so number four, practice intermittent fasting. Practice intermittent fasting. This is one of the core components of the Galveston diet is intermittent fasting. So um, among the well-recognized health benefits of intermittent fasting, and yes, if you're a woman, you can intermittent fast, and yes, if you're in menopause, you can intermittent fast. I have 72,000 students enrolled in the Galveston diet, most of them in perimenopause and menopause, and they are killing it with intermittent fasting. Now, Intermittent fasting is not a technique that you wake up overnight and you do. No. I teach our students to ease into it over five to six weeks. Give your body a chance to fast adapt. And I'm talking about daily intermittent fasting. Okay. We teach a 16-8 window, 16 hours of continuous fasting, followed by eight hours of an eating window. And that seems to work well for most people. It is not a fabulous way to lose weight. Okay. You can eat a lot of shit during your eating window and undo some of the good. It is a medical benefit to intermittent fast. It has to do with the practice of fasting, stressing out our cells just enough where it causes re more resilience. So like we're working out, we're stressing our muscles out. It causes the muscles to get stronger and be more resilient. When we fast, we set off a chain of events inside of our DNA and our, you know inside of our cells that causes them to be more resistant and um, impervious to disease. You're looking cute. Where are you going? Daughter. Oh, okay. Um, okay. So, so yeah, intermittent fasting, there are definite health benefits. Your visceral fat will go down if you fast, but you may not lose a ton of weight. Okay. Um, we use intermittent fasting as part of the Galveston diet because it works synergistically with the anti-inflammatory nutrition and the fuel refocusing to give people a better health benefit more than just weight loss. Remember when people calorically restrict studies have shown that half of what they lose is muscle. And to me, that's a fail. You do not want to lose muscle if you're trying to lose weight. You want to lose fat. You want to lose unhealthy body fat, right? And if you just calorically restrict and pay zero attention to your nutrition, you will most likely lose half of what you lose is muscle. And then your basal metabolic rate goes down. You end up yo-yoing and the whole thing starts over again. Um, okay, so, and then aerobic activity. Aerobic activity, aerobic activity, regular aerobic activity. Um, in that max fat burning zone, which is 220 beats per minute minus your age times 60 to 70%. So that's kind of your zone. So for me, it's like eh, 102 to about 120, somewhere in there at my age, um, is my max fat burning zone. So I spend a lot of time on the treadmill at a very you know modest walk at a little bit of an incline to hit that zone. I can actually work at that level. And so, and I just walk while I'm working or watching a TV show or something. Um, I'm lucky enough to have a treadmill in my house, but it like keeps me moving and it helps burn excess fat and helps keep my heart strong. So w people who do that on a regular basis have lower visceral fat. So um, I'm gonna get to the questions here in a second. All of this information is in our blogs at galvestondiet.com. The blogs are up here at the top. So everybody double tap the screen real quick. Throw me some likes. Um, you just tap over my face. And thank you for all the gifts that everyone's giving. Let me get to some questions. Um, and then we, if you go to the link in bio at the top of the TikTok page, we have our inflammation quiz, our perimenopause quiz. We have a free meal plan. We have lots and lots of things. If you click on the pause blog, um, we have tons of information for free in our blogs, including everything I talked about on this talk today. Hey, buddy. Sorry, my dog. What you doing, bubs? He's looking for my daughter. Okay. All right. Um, all right. So there are 17 questions here. 
So psyllium, what about taking psyllium? So psyllium husk is a very popular, very common, uh, very common fiber supplement. Actually, a lot, we have psyllium husk in the Galveston diet fiber. We also have apple pectin, um, a bunch of different um, brands from different grains to give it more of a variety so you get different nutrients. So I tried to do something regular than just Metamucil, which is psyllium husk. But if that's what you have and that's that's all you can get, that's fine. You know, that is a decent form. But remember, the majority of your nutrition, of your nutrients, including fiber, should come from food. We only supplement when there's a gap. Okay, the waist-hip number ratio. Okay, so the waist-hip ratio for a woman should be 0.85 or less. So it's the smallest part of your waist divided by the widest part of your hips and it is a better indicator of health than your weight or your BMI um, okay going to the questions remember um, please discuss well butrin for menopause okay so a, a SNRI or an SSRI or NRS you know any of the antidepressants um, should never be first-line therapy for the treatment of menopausal symptoms ever 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 I don't know we are not teaching physicians the right things we're not teaching OBGYN residents the right thing the number one thing that you should be offered for the treatment of your menopause symptoms should be hormone therapy 100% no questions asked. Now, you may choose not to do it. You may have a contraindication. There may be some reason why you can't take it. Then we move on to alternative forms. But Wellbutrin, um, um, I would not offer that as first-line therapy at all, ever, for menopausal symptoms. That, that, is, that, is my, that is not what should be done. Okay, I'm, I'm doing the questions right now, guys. Um, am I taking new patients? Absolutely. So if you go to, so everyone, if you click up here at Dr. Mary Claire and um, you go to the link at the top of my TikTok page, um, and also if you're watching on Facebook, if you just um, go to galvestondiet.com, you will see make an appointment with Dr. Haver. I practice in Texas in the Houston area. I'm My clinic's in Friendswood. Um, I am taking new patients. Uh, we are very full, um, but uh, you can try. You can get on the waiting list to see if you can get in. I do not accept traditional insurance because I have an integrity approach, which insurance will not cover. Um, go to the website and learn about it. You can look up Mary Claire Wellness or Dr. Mary Claire online, and it should take you to the website. So we'd love for you to come and see us and say hi. I talk about this one all the time. This is my daughter, Catherine. Come here. She is, what are you studying? Nutrition. And you are a senior. She's starting her, well, she just finished junior year, and she's also hoping to go to medical school. She just took the MCAT and is applying to medical school. So she keeps me honest with all the nutrition information. <laughs> so anyway, so meet Catherine. She has been uh, kind of critical to uh, my path and um, keeping me, making sure I'm presenting factual nutritional information and keeping me honest. So um, let's see. And um, she's kind of a badass. So super proud of her, super smart, super hard worker, wants to change the world one day. Um, all right, so, and she's home for the summer, yay. What vitamins should I be taking daily? Well, you should get the bulk of your vitamins from food and you only wanna supplement where there's a gap. So. Um, you know, most vitamins, you're just going to pee right out because you really don't need them. Um, I do not take a multivitamin per day. I take omega-3 and vitamin D. I use fiber and I use collagen on a daily basis. I also take a probiotic most days. Um, I am experimenting with something called NAD or NNM. Um, I read the uh, Lifespan book by Aunt the, uh, David Sinclair. And got me really interested in, in um, uh, extending healthy life. And so on a genetic DNA level. And so I'm taking resveratrol and uh, NNM or NAD for that. Uh, but it's an experiment. I, you know, it's not really something where you take it and you're going to feel better tomorrow. It's really something that's going to help me age in a healthier way because I have such a high risk of cancer. Um, like incredibly high risk of cancer. So... Let's go on a field trip. If you guys don't, if you're just joining me, you don't know that much about me. Um, I'll show you my family history. This is, uh, I don't know how to turn this around, so I'm just going to have to do it this way. So this is my dad, daddy. So he died um, of 
but basically end stage COPD. He was in his 80s. He had a great life, beautiful man, miss him a lot. His death was not tragic. It was expected. So, um, but he suffered the last 10 years. It was pretty rough from his COPD and he dragged an oxygen tank around. His, you know, quality of life is pretty poor at the end. And that is something I, I don't smoke. So I am, you know, hopefully going to avoid that. This is Jep. So Jep died when I was nine from leukemia. Um, he had ALL uh, and was one of the first patients at St. Jude's, which is why St. Jude's is one of my charities. And they kept him alive for a long time. I would never have known him um, had he died when he was diagnosed, which was a 95% death rate at the time. So uh, he fought cancer. He was in remission for about 11 years and then came out and died within a year. Um, and then my brother, Bob, this is Bob. He passed away in 2015 from end-stage liver disease. Um, miss him, super good friends with him. He is the catalyst for the Galveston diet and why I decided to study nutrition and um, help you know women get control of menopause. This all started um, with his death. And then Jude is my third brother. And he died in 2020, in July of 2020. Um, and he died from esophageal, in stage esophageal cancer. Uh, he fought it for about two years. So um, I have that family history. My mother, she has six siblings and five cancer, five <laughs> out of six. And my dad, about half of his siblings with cancer. So, um, I take this stuff very, very seriously. There's no guarantee I'm not going to get cancer, but I'm not going down without a fight. Um, so, uh, don't feel sorry for me. This is just real stuff that I'm a real person. And these are my motivations behind what I do. Um, okay. Back to the questions. Let's see. Are magnesium supplements okay? Maybe. So magnesium is kind of special in that about 50% of us are deficient in magnesium. They're not getting enough. And the only way to know is if you track your nutrition intake. Again, my favorite tracker chronometer um, up here at um, Dr. Mary Claire. Um, that is really the only way to know. And then if you... Um, there is medicinal benefits to taking super physiologic doses of magnesium. We use it to induce diarrhea, certain forms. So there's several formulations of magnesium and it depends on what you're treating. If you're correcting a deficit, some types are better. Some types um, don't have any bioabsorption, meaning they're not absorbed in the gut. They stay in the gut and they cause diarrhea. We use it to induce diarrhea for colonoscopies or colon, or colon surgeries when you want to have an empty gut, empty colon in case when you're doing colon surgery. I mean, that's medicinal uses for that. Then you have other forms like the one I take is magnesium althreonate and it's got, it crosses the blood brain barrier the best and it has a very calming effect. And so for depression, for ADHD for um, my daughter grinded, was grinding her teeth from her ADD meds. It helped relax her jaw. So it really depends on what you're trying to treat and different formulations will work for that, but they don't all work the same. So you really need to know what you're doing and why. Um, I will be coming out with a blog about this because I get so many questions about the different types of magnesium. Um, oh, what is my favorite anti-inflammatory meal? I got two. So one is uh, what I call like the kitchen sink salad. So I always have greens in the fridge and I will pull out the box of greens, throw them in a bowl. I will add, uh, my dressing is almost always olive oil, lemon juice, salt and pepper. Very simple. And then I will fight to put as many colors in the salad as possible. I will always have a bean. I will always have a nut, you know, and I will maybe have some kind of leftover protein thrown in there. And I'm like putting red, green, purple. So I'm trying to throw tomatoes or cucumbers or um, peppers or, you know, different vegetables in to eat the rainbow. Because the more colors you have on your plate, uh, each color represents a different phytochemical, which is going to help fight. I throw in beans for extra fiber and some dense, healthy carbs. I throw in nuts for the healthy fats, the fiber and the omegas. I, and that, that is kind of one of my go, it's making me hungry. So that's what maybe what I'm going to have for lunch. So I always try to keep that stuff on hand so that it's easy to throw that together. My second, um, I'll, I'll show you, uh, my second favorite. And I had that for lunch yesterday. I'm heading your way, baby. Watch out. 
My second favorite is uh, what we call Mary Claire's Parfait. So if you have no sensitivity to dairy, this is um, a really good option for you or you can find a dairy alternative. But um, here's fridge, be fine, here it is. So this is my favorite yogurt. So I'll take a plain yogurt, nothing added. There's nothing in this, but the only ingredients are milk and yogurt cultures, that's it. S. thermopolis, L. acidophilus, and bifidus. Okay, L. bifidus. So bifidus, and then it's full fat, nothing added, nothing taken out. It's just plain, okay? I have nothing, no dairy issues in our house. Our family can eat dairy. I don't drink milk. I don't like it, but I do use this. I like it because this is concentrated protein for me, and it has any, any uh, probiotics, okay? To it, I add a berry. I'll always usually have blueberries, raspberries, strawberries on hand. I like berries because again, different colors, packed with fiber, packed with micronutrients, and they don't raise your blood sugar that much. And they're, I love the tartness, the sweetness. I just love it. Okay, and then on them I add, y'all, I'll pause for a screenshot. Hemp hearts, why? Very high in protein. Remember, I'm trying to get 20 to 25 grams of protein for each meal or snack, you know, and then 10 or five to 10 for a snack. So this will give me a boost of protein. It also has, you know, manganese and magnesium. You know, this is a great source of minerals and um, for you. So I will put the dose, which is three tablespoons, onto my yogurt of hemp hearts. Okay, great, great, great source of protein. Wait, I will also add chia seeds. So I'll put one tablespoon of chia seeds. Why? Because this is a fabulous way to add extra fiber. Really high in fiber and also vitamins. Um, it also has three grams of protein, okay? And finally, I will add this. This is ground flax. Great source of omegas, okay? This is um, three grams of dietary fiber and rich in omega-3 fatty acids. So. This is a fabulous way to enjoy an anti-inflammatory meal. I'll also throw nuts on top, and I have a variety of nuts. I try to mix up my nuts every day. I have nuts every single day. Um, if people don't like the taste of the yogurt, I make a smoothie out of walnuts, so okay. and it's good. Here comes the dietitian. Um, so she says if, if people don't like the taste of it, make a smoothie out of it. What else would you add to your smoothie? Um, you sh well, okay, I'm sorry. Um, I'd like more fruit. Like more of like the berries just to mask the taste of the yogurt. Oh, if they don't like the taste of the yogurt? Yeah, well, I just don't like the um, like super heavy. Like I can't just pick it up and eat a spoonful Talk of to it. Me. You're not talking. Oh, um, so what I usually do is I'll put probably like about a fourth of a cup um, because I have a lot of trouble getting protein and this is a really good way and also either yeah water or almond milk or any type of milk that you like and do all of the ingredients that she just said and also frozen berries probably work best you can put any fruit but like she said the berries um don't raise your blood sugar as much and then um spinach is another thing i like to add for a little bit of greens um and yeah, that's it. That's what I usually do for like a snack or breakfast. And it's really easy to like pack and drink on the go. So yeah, I love smoothies too. They're great. Um, I'm not great at eating a lot of food. So especially like drinking it with a straw can help you get all of those um, extra nutrients in. So, okay. Yeah. Uh, can you put that? Okay. I just, yeah, I need both hands. Thanks baby. Uh, okay. Um, factor five Leiden is hormone replacement therapy. Okay. With that, um, turns out that transdermal forms. So, so that causative, um, oral forms of estrogen, when you ingest anything, okay, it has to go through the liver. What happens is it gets broken down into its component parts and then absorbed through our colon and small intestine. And then the portal vein picks all of that up and takes it through the liver for processing. If you, and that's where, um, when estrogen hits the liver, it will upregulate some of your clotting factors. And for people who are prone to blood clots, that could increase your risk. Transdermal or transmucosal forms, when you don't utilize 
you know, the oral route, go through fat and go straight into the bloodstream and bypass the liver. So you do not have as much or very little. I mean, the risk for transdermal is dramatically lower than for. So in the UK, they just don't give oral forms. Everybody gets transdermal. Um, and you do, and the risk of blood clots goes away. So just because you have factor five Leiden or have had a history of a blood clot, you still may be a candidate for hormone therapy. Um, so yeah, as long as you do transdermal. Okay. Um, I'm going to the questions. Do I have regular TikTok videos breaking down some topics? You must be new here. <laughs> I have thousands. <laughs> So many. So um, a lot of my TikTok videos also get up regular, up, uploaded to YouTube um, and to Facebook and to Instagram. So there is sometimes a little bit easier to find what you're looking for um, on those different platforms. Um, but on TikTok, I cover so many topics. But again, they get lost because there's so many of them. I make five, six TikToks a day sometimes um, answering questions or just trying to be informational about it. Um, okay, I am going to jump off. I've had a great time teaching you guys. Hopefully you all learned something. Everybody, please, to keep me relevant, double tap the screen to like the video and follow me if you haven't followed me. Share this video with someone you think it might be helpful for and um, I will join you again soon. All right, take care.